Hopefully you watched the video about Peter's life and his love affair with Heloise. This offers a great backdrop to his thought, particularly given the ways he understands sin as carnal and God as love. Now today we'll be reading a section, the most famous section, from his exposition of the Epistle to the Romans. So let's get started. Let's begin with what we already know from our introductory readings in the Course. Like so many other theological commentators, Trollstead interprets Anselm and Abelard in relation to each other. She says, Peter Abelard rejected Anselm's idea that Jesus' death was necessary for the forgiveness of sin. God could have reconciled humankind to God's self in another manner, and had done so in the past through the forgiveness of sin without any sacrifice. Thus, Jesus is not required to die to satisfy either the devil's dues or God's own honor or system of justice. So recall that Anselm also uh, denied the idea that um, God owed the devil anything because that was a ludicrous idea to him. But also here now Abelard is rejecting Anselm's idea that what needs to be satisfied is God's own honor or system of justice. So for Abelard, God instead chooses, remember again the importance of God's freedom for these thinkers, God chooses this particular mode of reconciliation or atonement, Jesus' death, in order to demonstrate the great depth of God's love for humanity. So this is different, different than God's honor. Here we're talking about God's love. In response to this demonstration of God's love through self-giving, humans would be inspired to greater acts of love and tender charity. Therefore, Jesus' death serves as a moral example or influence that elicits human faith and conversion. So you'll recall that when Anselm was compared with Abelard, the result was a way of interpreting him that failed to take account of the devotional dimensions of the text. Now, when we read Abelard next to Anselm, the comparison produces an entirely different set of interpretive problems. Unlike Anselm, Abelard rejects the significance of Jesus' death as the purchase price for the forgiveness of sin. But interpreting him in this comparative way tends to lead readers to think Abelard rejects the importance of Christ's death, period, or that he has little interest in the problem of sin. Neither will see, though, as true. Rather, Abelard simply doesn't make the direct link between Christ's death and the forgiveness of sins or the purchase price for that forgiveness. This is because he emphasizes a different theological aspect of God's character instead. Rather than God's honor or justice, he focuses on God's love. Jesus, as the God-man, therefore reveals the greatest depth of love by God for humanity and the capacity for humanity to be inspired to love God back. We actually have all the same pieces of the story, sin, death, forgiveness, new life, but they're arranged in relation to each other differently, with different meanings as they go. Now, Abelard's interpretation probably sounds more attractive to us than Anselm's. It fits our modern sensibilities, but it was extremely controversial in his day. Let's take a look at why. The first controversy that Abelard was criticized for in his day, but for which he tends to be praised for in our day, is exemplarism. With Athanasius and Anselm, Christ's incarnation, his passion, actually did something to the fabric of reality. It changed the fundamental relationship between God and humanity. But traditionally, Abelard's theology has been read to say that nothing is paid, nothing is satisfied, no one is appeased. Rather, for Abelard, Christ's incarnation and death manifest divine love in a way that awakens human love to response. We are inspired by God's love to love God back. In Abelard's time, this was controversial, even heretical. Now, for contemporary Christians, this is actually what tends to make Abelard more attractive than Anselm. Contemporary Christians can have a harder time believing in the resurrection or in the idea that Christ's life and death could make cosmic ontological changes to reality. The idea of Christ as a moral example for us to emulate offers an alternative to these more magical concepts that has come to hold popular sway. So, if you find yourself drawn by the image of a human Jesus who inspires ethical living, then you are to a cosmic or divine Jesus who changes your reality, I want to challenge you for a moment to consider why. Why do we, in our context, have a hard time accepting that Christ's death did something to the fabric of reality? For some, it's because the belief in miracles is no longer plausible in a scientific age. For others, this comes out of an interfaith concern not to elevate Christ's story over that of non-Christian religions. For some, it's because the idea of a death being necessary for salvation isn't as attractive as the idea of love being made manifest for us. 
If Christ as moral exemplar is attractive to you as you read Abelard, be sure to ask yourself what this vision loses as well as what it gains. Now, digging into the concerns with Pelagianism, the second controversy, might help unpack some of what is lost, because these two critiques of Abelard, exemplarism and Pelagianism, are connected. If Jesus Christ's primarily, primary or sole role is to provide humanity with a roadmap for how to live, then the implication is that we are redeemed by our own actions rather than by God's love. This is Pelagianism. This critique is a little harder to make stick on Abelard's writing than the one of exemplarism, given that in a section of the text we won't be reading today, he actually makes, names his reason for writing the Romans commentary as being to exalt God's grace over human action. Nevertheless, the idea that God's grace is not required for redemption does have the potential to follow from a Christology of Jesus as exemplar. If Jesus shows us how to be reconciled with God, rather than objectively connecting us to God, then it's our ability or willingness to copy his actions that redeems us. This view has the potential to be very helpful for a justice-centered theology because it focuses attention on what we as humans do, but it also makes salvation dependent on our own capacities. So be sure to consider the implications of this as you read also. Indeed, before we're too quick to reject or praise Abelard based on either charge, we need to see what he actually says and how what he says might challenge our own understandings of Christ's salvific work among us. Given that Abelard's view of sin is different than Anselm's feudal or legal view, let's take a look at what he does say. This passage is taken from a section we won't be reading today. Um, it's outside of the main section that we're reading. So let's take a look at it together. But I am carnal, he says. That is, I am given to carnal pleasures and earthly longings. Indeed, I'm so carnal that I am sold into bondage to sins. That is, I subject myself freely to sin and its slavery for a payoff in earthly goods, exercising every concupiscence in order to acquire and attain them. We have the power to sell ourselves into slavery, but we do not have the power to buy ourselves back. Innocent blood was given for us. Now we can free ourselves from the dominion of sin by our own powers, but only by the grace of the Redeemer. Now, I emphasize those economic words to show how it seems like Abelard is setting up the problem of sin, like Anselm did, as an economic transaction. But he's using the transaction of slavery here more like a metaphor than like an objective description. Just like Anselm, he doesn't believe that the devil owns us, but he also doesn't believe that God's system of justice literally holds us as slaves either, because then God could just set us free. So images of bondage and captivity are intended by Abelard to metaphorically describe sin's hold over us. Sin entraps us, multiplying its own desire for sin, our own desire to sell ourselves again and again in order to gain the goods of the world. Christ's life, death, and resurrection saves us in both cases, not because it buys us back, but because his life as an example to us shows us the way to live unbound from this ever-multiplying desire to sin. Now, with this definition of sin in mind, we can start digging into the passage at hand. Take a minute and pause the video and read this passage of scripture, either silently or loud. This is what Anselm, um, sorry, what Abelard is uh, exegeting in the section that we're reading here. So give yourself a minute or two to interpret some parts of it for yourself. What stands out to you? What seems important? Go ahead and hit pause now. Okay, so now that you're back um, and you've come up with some questions you would have asked of this Romans text, pause the video again to give yourself some time to read Abelard's first section, the exegetical section. And then ask yourself if this exposition ask yourself if this exposition impacts the questions that were raised for you when you read Romans. How do your questions align with or depart from Abelard's? Okay, go ahead and hit pause now to give yourself some time to do these activities. Now that you've read Anselm's exposition of the Romans passage and thought about your own theological questions, we can look together at what the core theological question it is that rides, rises for Abelard. It's phrased a number of ways throughout this section, but this one that comes near the end really sums it up well. So turn with me to page 283, the second from last paragraph of the section. Abelard says, 
In what manner have we been made more righteous through the death of the Son of God than we were before, so that we ought to be delivered from punishment? Let's go a little bit down to the end of the paragraph. Indeed, how cruel and wicked it seems that anyone should demand the blood of an innocent person as the price for anything, or that it should in any way please him that an innocent man should be slain, still less that God should consider the death of his son so agreeable that by it he should be reconciled to the whole world. Is this the same question that arose for you? If not, how does it differ? Let's note a couple things together about this question before we move on. First, we are made righteous in Abelard's scheme. We have to be made righteous. And not only that, but we are made righteous by Christ's death. He says we should have been punished, but we're delivered from what we deserve. Now that's the reality. That's the way things are for Abelard. What doesn't sit right with him is that God would have required the death of Christ as a price for making us righteous, particularly because Christ was innocent. So, if it's the case that the death does make us righteous, but it wasn't required by God as a price for that righteousness, then the question becomes how or in what way does that death make us righteous? That's the core question that Abelard sees coming out of this Romans text. Okay, so now hit pause on the video again and keep reading. Read this section titled A Question from page 280 to 283. And as you read, try to note all the ways that Abelard phrases and explores this fundamental question that he brings to the text. Okay, go ahead and hit pause now. Okay, now let's look at the solution together. It's named right at the beginning of the passage on page 283. Turn there now and let's read it together. Now it seems to us that we have been justified by the blood of Christ and reconciled to God in this way. Through this unique act of grace manifested to us, in that God's Son has taken upon God's self our nature, and persevered therein in teaching us by word and example, even unto death. He has more fully bound himself to us by love, with the result that our hearts should be enkindled by such a gift of divine grace, and true charity should not now shrink from enduring anything for him. So how are we justified by the blood of Christ and reconciled to God? Well, Christ takes our nature, our human nature, into himself in order to teach us how to live by example. Note that specific language, teach by example. This is the crux of Abelard's theology. Christ's death matters not because it pays a price, but because it manifests fully, it reveals fully, both divine love for humanity in Christ's divinity and the capacity for human nature to love fully, too, in Christ's humanity. In this revelation, God and humanity are bound to each other in Christ's person, and this connection is what enkindles our hearts, our human hearts, to true love, what Abelard calls charity, that is, the moral life. Okay, you're going to hit pause on the video and go ahead and finish reading this section called The Solution. And while you're at it, just go all the way to the end of the reading. Although um, that last section, Romans 3.27, you can read that uh, a little bit faster or skim it without going into too much depth. Um, so do that. Go ahead and, read and hit pause and then we'll come back for a little bit more reflection. So now that you're finished the reading, let's, uh, let's end this video with another pause for reflection. Between Anselm and Abelard, all the pieces are the same. We have humans as sinners, Christ's death is reconciling God and humanity, sinners turn to moral, loving living. None of the pieces are changed. It's their meaning in relation to each other, their connections, their inner workings. These are what are different between Anselm and Abelard. We even still have the threat of punishment here in Abelard's view. So take a minute to think for yourself. What are the core differences for you between Anselm and Abelard? Jot them down. We're going to uh, open with those in class, in our next class together. Thanks everyone. I look forward to seeing you next class.